Great. Good morning, everyone. Obviously, it's my first time presenting, so thank you for bearing with me. Um, my name is Lauren. I am the Outreach and Marketing Specialist here at the SBA, um, and I will be presenting the Access to Capital kind of soundbite this morning. Um, so to start, when it comes to your business looking for access to capital, it's really important to know kind of what you have and what you need before asking for it. Um, let's see if I can get to the next slide. All right. Um, so before you start a lending relationship, um, a few components are really key to explaining what your business is and what it does um, and what you're looking for. Um, so a great place to start would be a business plan. Um, this will provide a lender with a snapshot of your business market and your needs. Um, if you have a business plan and you need to revise it or if you need to create a business plan, um, resources can be found on SBA.gov on how to put one together. Um, but pretty much this will give the lender a great idea of your business as a whole. Um, next would be the amount and use of the funds. So it would be really beneficial to kind of go into your lender meeting and have a number in mind for what your business is looking for. Um, and to just really know about SBA loans in general, um, it is great to know first and foremost that it has to go towards your business somehow. Um, for example, um, you wouldn't be able to use an SBA loan to flip a house. Um, it would have to go directly towards your business. Um, next would be credit history. So your credit history will be pulled and used to determine um, credit risk and interest rates. So having an idea of your business's credit history as well as your own is great to do before going into a lender meeting. Um, next would be financial projections. So having your financial projections and class Cash flow information together and ready for submission will be um, kind of something that will make the process easier for you and the lender. Um, this will help gauge where your business qualifies and how you will pay back the loan. Um, so next would be collateral. This will be discussed with your lender, um, but I would say it's good to go in with an idea of an asset that you would be able to use for collateral um, to guarantee your loan. People use a home, property, car, um, inventory. Um, so just having an idea of what could be used would be great. Next would be your industry experience. Um, so using your industry experience is something that would really help you with confidence um, and make that conversation with your lender something that would flow naturally. Um, it would help them kind of, you know, feel good about what you're talking about. Um, our next slide, what do lenders suggest you do or know? Um, so the SBA asked some lenders who have great experience in the industry for advice, and this is what they said. Um, so Christine said to be prepared um, to discuss your own experience as it directly relates to the new business. Questions like how long have you been in this line of work or related work? Um, this allows the lender to feel comfortable that you know what you're getting into and how it should be managed. Diane said to do your homework and be prepared as possible. Remember, failure to plan is planning to fail. Um, so being sure that you're prepared before going into any kind of conversation will set you up for success. Um, Jerry says for any businesses or business owner, the best way to prepare for a meeting with a banker or capital funding source is to watch an episode of Shark Tank. The same questions that Mark, Mr. Wonderful, Lori, or Damien ask of the person pitching the investment in their company are the same questions a lender will ask you about your business. The three questions are, how did you get started? How do you make a profit? And what is your market? So these are all great kind of tips to keep in mind um, when preparing for meeting with the lender. Um, so why a lender looks to SBA guaranteed loans the SBA can help you stand out to your lender um, with the following scenarios and criteria. Um, so with a longer maturity or a length of your loan, a lack of collateral to secure the loan, an industry outside of their normal lending portfolio, prior credit issues, a length of time in business, and other possible factors leading to the loan um, that cannot be overcome except through having a federal loan guarantee. Um, overall, SBA loans can just help mitigate risk and also help a bank improve its activities under the Community Reinvestment Act, um, meaning that they work towards the lender's goal of lending in lower income communities. Um, so getting connected with an SBA lender, we try to make it easy. 
the first step would be to get online and go to sba.gov um, and utilize our lender match tool. Um, if you're looking for a list of New Hampshire community based lenders, please email new nh underscore lending at sba.gov. Um, but this tool pretty much helps you get connected on a one on one basis with lenders who can help your business. Um, so next slide, this will be a little bit about how the lender match process works. Um, so first you will kind of describe what you're looking for. You'll be answering a few questions about your business. This can take as little as five minutes. Um, next, you'll get matched with a lender. This process can take up to two days, but that's a pretty quick turnaround considering. Um, you'll receive an email with contact information of lenders who express interest in your business and the loan you're asking for. Um, we advise that you talk with many different lenders. Um, this will give you the opportunity to kind of compare rates, terms, fees, and other factors. Um, the last step would be to apply for the business loan. Um, so you'll submit your application, the paperwork, and you're, you know, on your way to securing a business loan. This is kind of the process for the lender match profile. Um, so you'll visit the loan page to kind of figure that out, but you'll go through this process and create a new request. Um, the page will ask you for some information about your business, where it's located, what your business does, how much experience you have, um, and kind of get some more information. And the next screen will ask you what funding you're looking for and how the funds will be used, um, how you'll you know use the funds and um, kind of the process for that. The last step would be matching. So you'd click the match button and then you should expect that email in your inbox in the next day or two. All right, so this will be um, kind of how the SBA helps small businesses get loans. So the um, page itself, sorry, lost my place. Um, SBA loan processes can kind of range from small to large and be used for most businesses. Um, this is a loan that can only be used towards your business. Um, SBA loans make Are you guys able to hear me? Sorry. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now. I see tapping on the headphones. I'm not sure if I cut out. Um, yeah, you, did, you did cut out a little bit. All right, I'll just, I guess I'll start this slide over. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess you could visit our loans page to find out the loan that best suits your needs. Um, we will discuss kind of the specific loan types in the next few slides, um, but the SBA only makes direct loans in the case of businesses and homeowners recovering from a declared disaster. So an SBA direct loan would only be in those two scenarios. Otherwise it would have to go through um, our lending partners. Um, as I mentioned, we have a list of those if you're looking for more information on that. All right, so use SBA loan proceeds for. So there's two kind of types of you know uses for this. It could be towards capital or fixed assets. Um, so if it was towards capital, that'd be something like uh, seasonal financing, export loans, revolving credit, and refinanced business debt. Um, and then fixed assets would be something like furniture, real estate, machinery, equipment, et cetera. All right. So these are kind of the three types of SBA loans. Um, they are a range of the 7A loans, 504 loans, and micro loans. I'll go into those just a little bit briefly, um, but more information is on our website on each of these. So the 7A loan um, is a group of SBA loans which guarantee portions of the amount, um, cap interest rates, and limit fees. The 504 loans are a long-term fixed rate financing to purchase or repair real estate, equipment, machinery, or other assets. Um, and then the third pipe is the microloan. Um, so this is our smallest loan program providing $50,000 or less to help businesses start up and expand. All right, so this is the SBA Resource Partner Network. We have a SCORE, SBDC, VBOC, and the New Hampshire Women's Business Center. Um, they're all approved and funded by the SBA, and they're great resources if you're looking for kind of coaching or mentoring 
Um, we'll be sure that these resources are accessible after the presentation for anyone who is interested. Um, this is kind of the wrap up of the presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, I have a I have a question. So as far as developing a business plan for somebody who's completely new to exploring opportunities with starting a business, what would you recommend as a, a good resource for that? Yeah, can, um, that's, I'm not sure if Miguel or Teresa would like to jump in. I, I, know resources. I can take that one. Yeah, I can take sure. that one, Lauren. Sure. So you're looking at starting an entirely new business and you, great kudos, congratulations. Um, yes, you do need a business plan before you go and look at any kind of financing or investing investment. Uh, the best resources we offer are those resource partners that were listed. Uh, if you are a uh, veteran or a veteran spouse, um, VBOC has great programs and resources available to you uh, that are veteran specific. Uh, that the rest are SCORE, um, the Small Business Development Center, and then the Women's, uh, the Center for Women and Enterprise. They don't just do women, um, but that's where they're based out of is the Women's Business Center. So you can go to them. They provide free advising, counseling, education, information, training. They are a wealth of resources. And we often suggest, you know, speaking to having one or more counselors. It's all free. Mm -hmm. So um, they may have events where there's a ticket price, but all of their advising and counseling is free. They can help you from uh, registering the business business, taxes, making sure you have um, a marketing plan, market research, analysis, all of that from A to Z for the life of your business. So um, I would definitely say that is the first step um, is reaching out to them, meeting with them, having the initial meeting and finding, finding the business advisor or counselor that you best work with um, so that you need that connection you know, um, to work through and they will walk you through each step. They will be there with you hand in hand. So you can build your team of expertise. <clears throat> That's great. Other, Thank you. Yeah. The other thing too, is like the, a lot of the commercial loan officers will look at your business plan. And if they actually seen that you actually had help to do any of the partners it's more likely they're going to help you. They, they're going to know that you actually did your homework on your business plan and about your business. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Were there any other questions? Uh, Cole from the chamber here. I think it's always just great to share a story, a success story, if there's someone you've helped out recently um, or a funding source that they were able to achieve through your help. Yeah, Teresa or Miguel, would you like to take that question? Uh, I can, I guess I can, I can take that one. Um, a specific story of, well, we're coming out of pandemic. So I think a lot of people would be surprised that every day there's hundreds of thousands of dollars um, that are being loaned from our local banks here in New Hampshire and credit unions to start small businesses to reopen small businesses. Uh, um, we did have an instance of someone who um, took the business from uh, making at home on our kitchen table. Um, that she was doing little uh, green cards. Some of you may know of this company. <laughs> uh, they are, you know, they are in New Hampshire. Um, and yeah, funny, um, funny greedy cards. And then it grew and grew and grew and they needed the loan to go get um, additional space warehouse space mm -hmm. production space um and it was you know they came through sba they went to the state so we do partner with the business and economic affairs um there is a whole network of support and mm -hmm. they are i believe an sbdc counselor and i think you uh, a client you would be surprised by the number of businesses so our offices are here in concord but you'd be surprised by the number of main street businesses that are either small business development center clients score clients 
CWE or Center for Women and Enterprise clients, or they are a client of all three. Um, so I encourage you to, you know, go out, find the right advisement, um, listen to that advice you go. I think it's knowing that you're coachable, right? They're not trying to take over your business or make right. all the decisions, but they can help you. So there's a lot of small success stories, small business success stories. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that one sticks out in my mind because in a matter of five years, the, the, her, uh, those cards are in every, I think, CVS, grocery, you'll find them everywhere. And it's right here in New Hampshire on our kitchen table. It started <laughs> with doodling. <laughs> so I, I like to give another ex example of that. Um, Dub Zero, it's an ice cream place. Um, so when they're veteran owned, when they originally saw this um, particular franchise, it was advertised on Shark Tank. So these people were trying to expand their business and Shark Tank kind of turned them down. So these two veteran owners in, in New Hampshire love the idea of what they're doing. So they reached out to Sub-Zero and bought the rights for the New England area to um, to open up a few stores in New Hampshire. So if you haven't seen Sub-Zero or tried their ice cream, check them out because I know there's one in Nashua and there's one out of Manchester. I think we also have a boozy ice cream. Yes. Uh, boozy ice cream business. Um, how about the uh, veteran who does the apparel? The yeah. recycling apparel. I mean, there's so many. There's so, just so many. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. All right. And then before we pass it over to Teresa, I just, just want to share our district office team. Um, this is everybody on our list. Um, so this is a resource we'll also share and make sure everybody has before the end of the presentation. Um, so thank you all for listening to my little bit. I'd like to pass it on to Teresa. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Let me thank get you, my Lauren. screen set up and hit to share. Did you stop sharing? Yep. I believe so. Okay. Okay, go to share. Okay, hopefully you see what I'm seeing, a big blue screen with SBA yes, on it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. I, yes, as Lauren said, I'm Teresa Pinto. I am the uh, a business development specialist here with the SBA offices. So I wear multiple hats. I am an outreach and marketing specialist liaison for Belknap County. Um, I handle the government contracting side of things. And that is going to be uh, what my presentation is on, finding new revenues. So um, a lot of people don't think necessarily about government contracting. Um, I handle the federal government contracting, but we also partner with uh, small businesses with the DBE, who is working New Hampshire DOT DBE, all these acronyms, I'm sorry, uh, that does um, the state certification. So if you want to do business with the state agencies or you want to do business with your local town or city, a lot of times contracts are issued for that. Uh, through the DBE program for the state and then federal, it's through our offices. Then I also do the women's business representative. So if you're, um, I do a lot of outreach for women to encourage them to grow and start businesses, uh, small businesses here in New Hampshire. And I'm going to hopefully hit my next slide. She went over that. So we'll just jump right into it. So finding new markets and which, how do you do, um, how do you explore government contracting and ex exporting opportunities? That's the other side of this presentation. Again, a lot of people don't think about it as a revenue source, but it is once you have your B2B, once you have your general revenue source, business to commercial uh, customer or business to business set up and operating, 
then government contracting or exporting can be used to diversify your revenue streams um, and give you another source of revenue. Um, I would say that government con contracting and exporting, unless your business, your startup is specifically starting in this space in terms of you're going to sell online and you're you're exporting your services or you're consulting and you are open to international clients then exporting and government contracting really are for more established small businesses to consider and to question or to look into so first i'll go over government contracting this is very brief i, uh, I just don't i think your slides aren't advancing i'm just seeing the sba oh. logo on here oh okay <laughs> i gotta freeze how about now oh, much better thank you i keep getting fro frozen okay so government contracting exporting goods and services here you go um the questions to ask yourself this is very high level i'm not going to get into the weeds <laughs> with you on this um it's just some questions that you can ask yourself and enough knowledge that you can consider it um and say yes or no uh, whether you want to pursue it. So the government, the federal government buys everything. Okay. The federal government does not make anything. So it has to purchase everything. And each year, uh, I think in the last fiscal year, that was over $6 billion worth of purchases that were made. And that's across the federal government. So all of the agencies from health and human services to the department of education, education to the Department of Defense, which covers, of course, all of our, um, our, our services, our branch services, Army, Air Force, Navy, etc. How do you get into that? And how do you say, hey, this is a potential, I would like a percentage of that, you know, um, I'd like to take a look at what, what the federal government buys. So they buy everything from screws to toilet paper to food, to landscaping, and then the other side of the, the equation is exporting. It's a big old world out there. And a lot of people don't realize that if you sell even to Canada, yes, that's exporting. You are exporting. Um, there's in-country exporting. This is talking, when we talk about exporting goods and services, we are talking out of country exporting, not from state to state just to be clear, since we're a federal agency. Okay, um, so is your business ready? Does the government buy what you sell? That's a pretty easy, easy question. Um, and how do you go about doing that? How do you go about doing your market research to see if the government would be buying what you sell? Well, I just said the government pretty much has to buy everything. So Depending on what you sell, yeah, there may be an opportunity. There may be consistent buying, which means year after year, there's regular buying, or there may be one-offs where um, it's a very unique item that you're doing or it's specialized and they would buy or do a, a contract with you once every three years. So think about um, when they need to buy a very specific, highly technical um, software or, or they need um, equipment as in machinery equipment or anything to do with vehicles, et cetera. They may not be buying every year, but they would be buying every few years versus, you know, copy paper and ink. Um, that's going to be a consistent, regular, every year, every month buy. Do you have experience in federal contracting? Um, and that's a big one. And a lot of people say, well, no, I'm, you know, I, I've never done it. But where do I start? I have an interest. And I would say that you always start by learning, being knowledgeable about what that market looks like. How do I go about getting educated on all the acronyms and the lingo? Government contracting is a world of its own. It's a very different lingo. It's heavily regulated as it should be. These agencies are spending taxpayer dollars. So yes, I want them to make sure that they are doing everything above board and that where they're spending those dollars, they're doing their due diligence that that small business is legitimate and can is giving a fair price for our taxpayer dollar spend and that they can deliver on the, the promise of a contract. Um, so 
how do I get federal contracting or government contracting experience? A lot of small businesses start with their local government, start at the state level um, and slowly work their way up. You may not get, uh, let's say the army is buying copy paper. You may not get the contract to supply an army base or all of the army bases with copy paper, but you may be a subcontractor and that's where you start to get your experience. Maybe you supply, you're a local supplier. We all know one by name and they drive around in these trucks. <laughs> I'm not going to give their name, but let's say you're them and you supply copy paper. Okay. Well, the, the bigger agency or the bigger company that has the contract that has the ability to get all the small businesses to supply them and then deliver. So you can become a subcontractor. That's how you get um, experience. It's a good place to start. The other question is, do you have the cash, the inventory and the working capital? Um, and that's what we call capacity uh, about taking on a contract because once you sign on a contract you are signing to the federal government that you will deliver on your promise that you can do this so um yeah they'll, they'll look at that very much so that do you have the cash to buy the supplier to hire the people for this specific job if you're in construction there's bonding that needs to happen do you have the inventory if i'm going to supply 1000 cases of copy paper i say yes i can do 1000 cases it's a copy paper. I need to show that either I have that on my inventory or I have the cash or the credit available to purchase that inventory and to manage that inventory and deliver it. And that's where we come in with working capital. Are you capable of fulfilling a government contract? We went over that. And then the market research. So it's pretty, uh, it's some very basic questions to start asking yourself. All of this ties into understanding what a set-aside is. That is how the government buys uh, a solicitation. They publish on SAM.gov a solicitation. We are looking to buy this. We need somebody to do this. And for small businesses, there are goals that are set by the SBA for every federal agency, every contracting or purchasing office that they must meet. So remember that $6 billion? 5% of it must go to woman-owned small businesses. And this is across the country, across the United States. 12% must go to small disadvantaged business and so on and so forth, so as you can see. So when you look at this pie chart, everyone goes, yeah, but I'm a small business and I'm not woman-owned and I'm not veteran-owned. Um, so, well, that big gray pie is a small business set aside. When a solicitation comes out, when they're looking to buy, they have to denote or mark how is this being competed? Is this open and full, which means open to large and small to everyone? Or is this a small business set aside? So that's the key. You do not need a certification, which is what these four categories are. They're certifications that SBA gives a business. You just need to meet the size standard for small to compete for that $6 billion. So these are set aside, the little parcels um, carved out of that small business set aside. So I just wanted to give you that overview. Um, I get a lot of people that say, well, I don't qualify for any of these. You can still compete and win government contracts. Um, so onward we will go. Oops, I don't want to. There we go. Our role in government contracting assistance. Um, there you go. There's 150 uh, billion. Uh, it gets awarded, but that is uh, because of multi-year awards and those large when they do a you know shuttle up into up into space or they're buying tanks or etc. So there's a lot of money that's being spent every year. What we do, we do things like this. It's me. I I outreach. I talk to small businesses um, and. I, you know, I just explained to them that government contracting is a valid opportunity for almost every small business. Um, of course, yes, there are certain that, you know, it's not going to be a, gen a revenue stream generator for them. Um, I can talk about the guarantee loans that are general and contract specific. We do have a lot of people that are in government contracting naturally that are um, 
utilizing working capital loans or lines of credit um, so that they can bridge over when they are waiting for the federal government to pay. And the days of, and you may have heard, oh, it takes too long for the federal government to pay. Those regulations, that, that has changed. There is a strict guidance and policy that they need to pay within a timely manner to small businesses. Um, it's right there in their code of federal regulations. So typically there's a pay schedule um, that says upon delivery, or at the front end and then you know you get some at the front end and then midway through and then at the end um, at final close out of the contract they'll pay within 30 to 60 days so the days of waiting six months do not happen with the federal government the surety bonding program again specific to contract uh, to construction um, that's bonding to make sure it, what it says surety it gives assurances to the government that should something happen with this construction project due to delays or not natural disasters or not being able to complete, then the government has protected the investment of the taxpayers um, and there is a guarantee. It is bonded um, to make sure that the government doesn't get stuck foot a bill and then not get what they um, had contracted for. And then the certification programs that we just went over. I keep hitting the wrong one. There we go. And I give you this slide. You, I believe, Cole, that they'll be getting these slides afterwards. Um, yeah. This gives you a good overview of the different certification programs and the top um, qualifications. You must have managerial experience. Uh, you must be involved in your business um, every day, a majority of your time. It cannot be what's termed a side hustle. OK, these certification programs are taken very seriously and they're not easy to get, nor are they um, easy to maintain you uh, for some of them. Uh, if you go after an economically disadvantaged women owned small business, you need to make sure that you are in what's called um, a NAICS code or North American industry classification. Again, government speak. Basically, you're working in a sector where there's not a lot of women that own. That's basically it in a nutshell. You must be a U.S. citizen and have 51% ownership requirement. That's when you're talking about woman-owned or veteran-owned. That 51% ownership requirement, and that means active ownership. That means, um, uh, what would you call it? Authority, right? Decision-making authority must rest with the either the woman or the veteran. Um, and you must hold the highest office uh, position. And they do look at time of business um, for certification. These certifications are specifically for federal, federal government contracting. There is a what I'll call a B2B. Um, if you're not in government contracting, but you want the woman-owned small business, there is one that is offered through our partner, the Center for Women in, uh, Enterprise, and it's called the WeBank, Women Enterprise Network business center um, that is for let's say the the corporate side of things so that um, you can do uh, network working and look at con I hate to say contract um, you can look at opportunities to do b2b um, with your women woman owned small business sir and then I just give you some links to the portal. There's great knowledge bases. Again, I'm doing very brief overview. I just wanted to have you ask yourself those questions. It could be something that you look at down the road and that's fine. Next, can I really afford to export? Here's where we begin. Again, asking yourself these questions. This is really interesting. Interesting and, and people don't realize, but once you start doing the research, if you're at the, hmm, should I put exporting on my radar screen? Not nearly 96% of consumers live outside the U.S. Interesting. Now, that does not mean that all that 96% is going to be interested in your services or Maybe your services are not typically seen in their country in the corporate world. Maybe it's provided by a heavily regulated government um, position or that your product is 
I don't know. I'm trying to think of a U.S. Uh, product. Oh, let's say beer. Okay. Craft beer is really big around here right now. So, you know, how do you get your craft beer? Well, you, uh, you know, into this 96%, you would do your market research and you could identify countries where you will not be able to export your craft beer to that country. Either one, they don't have a lot of consumption of craft beer or it's so heavily regulated and it's so expensive. So that's part of that market research. People go, oh, 96%. Yes. But market research comes in. Due diligence. Do your homework. <laughs> Two thirds of the world's purchasing power is in foreign countries. That becomes very appealing. And then always here, ask yourself the questions, evaluate your, re your readiness. And there's a lot of resources, knowledge, uh, assistance um, that's available out there to help you determine when and if exporting is for you. Exporting is an untapped market opportunity. A lot of people, like I said, because we're in New Hampshire and geographically how we're laid out, they think, oh, I sold such and such a four-wheeler up into a Canada. You've just exported. Um, and we're not recognizing that. Or they do design build or engineering services, and they have a client that sits up in Canada, um, and they go up there to do it. That's exporting your consulting or, or your services. So it is all exporting. Every day, New Hampshire companies are receiving inquiries from your, all over the world. Um, and it is a growing opportunity. And yes, we have several small businesses here in New Hampshire that are strictly e-commerce. And every time somebody buys whatever it is uh, from their website, and they're sitting outside of the United States, they are exporting. So just be aware of that. We can help you go global by helping you get the counseling, the training, asking the right questions, evaluating your business. Um, you know, this is another situation where do you have the cash? Do you have the working capital? Um, is your website international friendly? Um, do you have the right encryptions and securities if somebody's to purchase directly through your website? Um, do you understand all the legal accounting and auditing that's going to happen? And who do I pay? Do I pay different taxes when I export uh, to Canada? All of that. It takes time for you to make sure that you are not only process and system wise, but you are knowledgeable market wise and that you understand all the regulations depending on which country um, you are exporting to. They all have different importing fees, regulations, et cetera. So it's a lot of, it is a lot of homework, but I always think it's worthwhile if you're, if you think it's a consideration, follow the questions, go down your path of asking yourself the question. And if it's not now or not ever, or in nine years, you know, that's okay. At least you have done the process um, and thought about if it's an opportunity for you. Export, there are export funding programs specifically for small businesses who do want to get into exporting. As a matter of fact, our New Hampshire Office of International uh, Commerce is having a meeting coming up, a session on what they call their STEP program. And that STEP program that they offer um, it's grant funds to help small businesses in New Hampshire market to international customers and clients and explore the opportunity of exporting. And actually the STEP program is funded by the SBA. So um, that's where you see us. So we are driving dollars to help your New Hampshire small business explore opportunities in exporting. And I think that's coming up September 24th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I can try to get that information over to, to Cole if, um, so that you have it, Cole. Export assistance, there it is, step. Um, and what you can do is look at uh, matchmaking services, virtual events. Um, it can help with your exporting skills. Um, if you need to learn the systems distribution, if you need to get your website up to speed or change some things to make it more international friendly, um, that's what those grant dollars, um, that's what you would apply for. And that's what those grant dollars can help you.
you. And you can receive up to 6500 And there are small businesses here in New Hampshire that have gone several times. It's not a one-off. So if you apply and you would get the 6500 this year, it's not like, oh, I'll never get it again. You can apply. You can't just keep applying for the same project or reason, but you can, you can uh, apply multi-years and receive it multi-years. A lot of our maple sugaring, uh, maple exporting small businesses here in New Hampshire have done a really good job of, of uh, utilizing and leveraging the, the step grant program. And then I give you the same resource network. And then uh, when it comes to government, I'm not sure what those little dashes are, but <laughs> um, there we go. The federal government contracting, there's a really quick tool on our website, sba.gov under federal contracting assistance and it's am i eligible you answer about four or five questions and it will tell you if you are eligible for a certification it does not it's not telling you you are eligible or not for government contracting it's telling you that if you're eligible and you might be able to achieve a or apply for a certification um, program but there's also the size standard so are you small and honestly outside of construction um, the size standard for small business is typically 500 employees or less so pretty much 99 percent Cole would know this 98 percent of the state of New Hampshire is small business 500 employees or less I think for construction it might be five million or no, it's got to be, it's got to be, yeah, some of it is $19 million in revenue. Um, some of the sectors in construction are, um, so there's a lot of knowledge and information. And those are all live links that we put in there. And then on the exporting side, we give you the, the links to those offices that provide resource training. Just take advantage of every opportunity to learn more. I always believe that knowledge is power the more you understand of what's out there and avenues um, for revenue potential revenue streams the i think the better strategies you develop and it's okay if you go through the process and you decide that exporting is not for you that's fine at least you went through the process and you've gained knowledge of what exporting is because you may be able to help somebody else and there we go that's me in a nutshell can I answer any questions or anybody got anything? Uh, not seeing any questions, but I thought what stood out a lot was just the 96% of consumers are outside of the U.S. So right. not something that obviously fits into every business that uh, either of us deals with, but a huge market just out there. Something to think about, at least if you haven't before. I think so. I think, Cole, I think a lot of people, like we said, right, um, it just seems overwhelming. You're a small business. You're just trying to do your, you know, five days, whatever it is, right? You're just trying to make your dream happen. And we focus on, it's kind of like, um, you know, like you go to the same places to eat a restaurant. You go shopping at the same places, right, time and time again in our local communities or wherever. And we get into that habit where we're staying in the same space. Um, when you're looking at your small business, um, you need to say, hmm, you know, I, well, is there a possibility? How do I do it if I wanted to sell in Massachusetts or I wanted to market in Massachusetts or New Hampshire and then, or Vermont and then go further and further out? Because honestly, to get product to the other side, to California, you could have that product sitting in, in Europe somewhere. Mm -hmm. because that's how distribution works right um so it is a possibility and what i love about it like i said is the process the questions you ask yourself the market research you do will benefit your company and even whether it's government contracting or um, exporting or um, expanding your market all of that research that process that you go through to answer the questions you do every day in your business. Oh, should I buy this? Should I put this in my store? Should I look at putting this product out? Um, you know, 
is somebody interested in buying more chocolate ice cream than than vanilla ice cream um it's a process it's rinse and repeat so yeah that's what i love about it is there's so much potential there wonderful mm -hmm. awesome not seeing any other questions um we'll wrap it up here for today uh We'll have a recording that we'll put out, and then also um, I'll share your slides with um, folks who registered who weren't able to make it. Some folks had reached out to looking for the information. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll be happy to send that along. And yeah. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Awesome. All righty. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Cole. Great.